is Dr. Brenda Hunda. I'm the Curator of Invertebrate Paleontology at the Cincinnati Museum Center. I've had the pleasure of working at CMC for the past 17 years. And one of the reasons why I chose a museum career was because I really wanted to blend my two uh, loves, that is public science education and scientific research. Of course, museums can act as a bridge between the scientists and the research they're doing and translating that material and that information into the public arena or public setting. Um, and I love to do both. And when I started um, at the Museum Center, I really saw myself as a paleontologist, a trained scientist that happened to work in a museum setting. But over the last 17 years, with work with other colleagues from other museums, work with my own colleagues in various departments like exhibits and education, um, I have come to actually switch my priorities slightly and learn that I'm actually a museum person that happens to be a, a paleontologist. Um, and so with that in mind, I'd like to talk to you today about helping people see themselves in science. Um, over the past 17 years, I've learned an awful lot from my colleagues. And so these really are some of the tools that we use that we have learned along the way. Certainly, um, I have no training in public science communication or in education in and of itself. But because of the work that I have done on various projects, I have learned some ways that I think um, can help us get people to see themselves in science. And fundamentally, um, I've learned that um, helping people connect with science is also fundamentally a DEAI issue, uh, diversity, equity, access, and inclusion into the sciences. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. So what we're really talking about here is uh, STEM identity. That is being able to see yourselves in the STEM field that you choose, consider yourself a member of that STEM field, and maybe see yourselves in terms of how others view their specific prototypes of that STEM field. And the concept of identity has become increasingly important factor in the study of uh, STEM education and science communication. And adopting a science or STEM identity is effective because it creates a set of positive expectations that leads to engaged learning. Unfortunately, when students lack a STEM identity, this really does increase their chance for disengagement um, and creates really a negative feedback loop. Uh, this disinterest can weaken an emerging STEM identity and make it less likely for children to pursue a STEM field or STEM-related activities in the future. Uh, specifically for young women and minority students who are underrepresented um, in many STEM professions, finding a STEM role model they can look up to can prove challenging and popular culture does not provide many solutions for this. So coming from the paleontology world, um, I'll give you an example of, of, uh, of what I mean by um, not having much representation. Now paleontology is interesting because it is actually really out there as a media darling of um, one of the STEM sciences, thanks in large part to dinosaurs and the prototypes that we see of what a paleontologist actually is. Um, so when we think of paleontologists and we see them in the media, we tend to think of rugged white males who work in very remote field locations. They're usually using heavy equipment. They're usually dusting off dinosaur skeletons. Um, there's intense conditions. There's rattlesnakes. There's um, steep slopes. There's hot temperatures. Where you, they're usually dirty, dusty, sweaty. And this is kind of the idea of what you think of, um, for the most part, uh, when you think of a paleontologist. I, of course, am a paleontologist and don't fit uh, most, if not all, of those criteria. <laughs> but the media does portray paleontologists um, as these, these rugged white males. So these are some um, images of paleontologists in the field or uh, from some of our favorite popular science shows, uh, including Jurassic Park, where we see sort of this rugged, male machismo persona of what it means to be a paleontologist. Um, many of these scientists do quite effective public science communication. And so by no means am I saying that they're not doing great work. It's just that this is what the public sees, what children sees as the persona of what it means to be a paleontologist. Of course, this is the identity that I came up against starting in graduate school and actually an undergraduate, where all of the um, mentors that I had in my college education were males um, and at that point in time in the 90s there was not a single female geologist um, on 
staff at the university that I was at. That of course has changed quite a bit and paleontology and geology more broadly have made many, many leaps and bounds into including a more a diverse set of individuals in the field. Um, this depiction of what paleontologists are and who we are really is able-bodied, it's cisgender white males that dominate the discipline, and it's really presented from a Eurocentric view because the history of paleontology really has focused on Western civilization. But when I think of paleontology, this is what I think of. Um, I'm in Cincinnati and we have an amazing uh, fossil resource here. We are world famous for our fossils and we're very lucky. And I get to work with all kinds of people from amateurs to families to children, um, diverse sets of backgrounds in the field. And I get exposed to a lot of amazing people, um, including underrepresented groups um, to paleontology. Uh, but very until very recently, really, we haven't seen much attention given to a diverse set of paleontologists, aside from uh, Mary Anning of England, who is our token historical female figure. Um, so as a result of this, even if students belonging to minority groups are interested in fossils, it may be that they're really unable to visualize paleontology as a viable career option. So students uh, might not feel as though they belong in paleontology or other sciences and might fall victim to inherent biases like stereotype threat or imposter syndrome that has often been reported across STEM fields. Um, I was very lucky in my graduate work. I had an amazing uh, graduate advisor who was a female scientist, mother, and a fantastic mentor um, who helped me to, to see myself as a paleontologist. We have this slight disconnect between how the media portrays scientists um, in paleontology and in, in my experience what the actual truth is about how people in the public and in the sciences experience paleontology. I want to touch for a moment on really how scientists sort of engage with the public in paleontology. Uh, because paleontology is sort of the media darling of a lot of the STEM um, science, just like astronomy is another example, um, we do have a lot of scientists that are engaging with the public. It is true that most scientists do see public as being interested in paleontology and in science in general. Um, many scientists do see debates over scientific research in the media, particularly when it comes to their own field of study. And a lot of them do feel that, that social media can advance or support um, their careers, but the media and engaging with the public in that venue can often pose uh, problems for science and scientists. So I just pulled a couple of examples. This is by no means a, uh, a broad brush, but a couple of examples of how uh, scientists and um, enthusiasts really do engage in blog format uh, with the public. And really what you can see here is sort of two uh, various uh, versions. Um, when scientists do engage with the public um, in blog format, it tends to really be pretty um, heavy scientifically handed. Uh, we see examples here with Extinct that um, they're showing all of the wonderful bar graphs and dots and so forth of their study of T-Rex. Of course, T-Rex is a classic example that would engage the public in science, start adding some bar graphs and some dots on there, and you might uh, lose a few people along the way. Um, another example, uh, very high level discussions about philosophy and theories in blog format related to science and paleontology. Uh, and then we see this other group that really deals with paleontology in terms of uh, enthusiasm and enthusiasts who take the literature that they find out there and translate it more into the public science arena. So it's not necessarily the scientists themselves that are communicating directly, but rather indirectly through uh, enthusiasts who take their work and translate it um, into the public arena. And even in this um, way of engaging, uh, it can still be pretty high level. So there really are sort of two ways to approach teaching science, getting people to see themselves in science. One is the top-down approach and one is the bottom-up approach. And um, I'll say it here, and that is that we need both. Um, this is not a one or the other situation, um, but I wanna focus today a little bit more on the bottom-up approach. So the top-down approach really is um, 
tends to be oppressive, can oftentimes be dictatorial and authoritative. It is scientists, it is governments uh, creating policies and procedures. Sometimes it's forcing um, people to act a certain way. Uh, oftentimes when we talk about uh, top-down science, we're looking at things at an abstract viewpoint or a global viewpoint. Um, an example of this would be uh, climate change, where really we're talking about policies and protocols. A lot of the verbiage with top-down approach um, talks about uh, crises, catastrophes, which can be very off-putting um, to the individual. Um, it's very authoritative. It, it, it follows mainly systems and here's the directives of things that we must do. Whereas the bottom-up approach takes things more from a global perspective down to the community, local, regional perspective that, that provides a bit more action-oriented, focus more on individual families and communities, and maybe gives um, those communities and individuals sort of a relevance to what they're doing, why they're doing it, and the ownership and control of that. So the idea being that many individuals doing small actions uh, leads up to a, a big, a big um, result. So like I said, I'm going to focus a little bit on the bottom-up approach today. Um, thinking about working within communities, individuals, and families to help them make connections with science. And we can do that through uh, the five plus one R's of public science engagement. And these are relevance, relatable, real, right here, a sense of place, and reframing. And all of these five R's uh, provide a context to create relationships. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that works. Um, I've used a classic example here of toothpaste um, to, uh, to show us how these various things might work. Um, toothpaste is, uh, is very scientifically engineered. It's very interesting. There's a lot of math and physics involved in making toothpaste and just getting it in those toothpaste tubes. Um, there's some biology involved in how it affects us and how it works. Uh, the minerals that are used in toothpaste are geological in nature. Of course, there's a lot of chemistry and chemical engineering to make toothpaste. But I use toothpaste as a way to connect because, first of all, everybody pretty much knows what toothpaste is and they use it every single day. And they might not think of toothpaste as very sciencey, um, as having a lot of science, but indeed it does. And in fact, most of the tools and things that we use in the world today have science behind them. So it's relevant to our daily lives. It's immediately relatable and real um, in that people have it in their homes. They can understand it. They can see it. They can use it. It is right here in our homes. It, it provides us that sense that, it, you know, we're connecting with it. Um, and it can be a way to help us reframe some challenging concepts about chemistry, biology, and geology. Uh, when we put all of these together, it helps us to create a relationship with science um, and public science engagement with the individuals. Now, I'm not proposing that everybody do an exhibit or a program on toothpaste. Um, it could be anything that we can find that follows these five plus one R's. Um, but I want to give you some examples of how the Museum Center um, is working with these R relationships. So one of the first things we started doing was working with communities, not really working at communities. So in 2017, we had a pretty interesting opportunity. We were getting a complete renovation of our 1930s Art Deco train station main union terminal, um, which required us to really take all of our programming and our activities out of the building for over two years. And as a result of that, we were able to make very specific connections and take our work out into the community. Now, before we did this, we kind of thought we understood what the community needed um, and would create programs and exhibits that we thought or reflected on what um, our visitorship wanted. It turns out when we went out into the community, um, we found out that actually some of the needs were very, very different than what we realized and very specific to very different neighborhoods. So we chose four underrepresented neighborhoods to work with, West End, Price Hill, Carthage, and Madisonville. And we went out as a team and we asked them, what do you need from us? Where can we support your community initiatives? Um, and each community had a very different answer. When we support community initiatives, that means that we have a representative 
from the Museum Center that works with their community councils, that attends their community meetings, that attends their festivals and their events in the community, and really talks to the people and asks the questions. So I've got four examples here of the ways in which we were able to engage uh, with various neighborhoods in Cincinnati. The first one is the West End. Uh, now this community really, the work that we did here is actually comes from an historical viewpoint or vantage point. Um, rather than a, a completely scientific viewpoint, but I put it in here because I just want to make the point that history and science are not mutually exclusive when we are trying to teach science, and that where there's opportunities to teach history, there's opportunity to teach science, and likewise in the other direction. Uh, we worked with an extensive project with the West End on talking about their Kenyan Bar neighborhood, which was a, a predominantly African-American neighborhood that was raised completely in 1958 to make way for neighborhood uh, re uh, rejuvenation projects. Um, of course, uh, we used our museum resources like our photo archives and our historical documents to bring this aspect of their community to life. Incidentally, this neighborhood is right where the museum center is, so it was a fantastic working relationship. But of course, with that historical work, um, does give us the opportunity to teach about the science um, or science concepts that went along with raising a complete neighborhood, including things like uh, impacts on health um, and both psychological and physical and other things like that. So that was a really fantastic relationship that still continues. Uh, with Price Hill, once we got into the community council there and started talking with the people, we realized that they have a very, very large Guatemalan immigrant community. And that allowed us to work with them specifically with our Maya exhibit that recently came in. Having people tell their stories, learning more about their culture, and also attending their Day of the Dead festival in Price Hill, which allowed our, our curator of zoology to bring a Quetzal bird along um, from our collections and talk about the science of bird vision, uh, color, and how birds see color, and the science of bird flight. So we were able to take resources that we had from our collection and make it directly relatable and real right in the place where these people were living and allowed us an opportunity to talk with them about various scientific concepts and to make that connection and that relationship with them. In Carthage, we took what was a CMC interior uh, festival, the Cincinnati Mini Maker Fair, and we took it out to them in their community. They were very interested in more STEM learning and STEM training for um, their uh, for their neighborhood, and we took our Mini Maker Fair and we put it right in Carthage and up uh, and asked them to participate as much as they could. So they had um, a couple of days of all science events right in their neighborhood where the community could participate. And in Madisonville. Uh, one of their main issues was not having enough nature-based programming. They have a lot of trails and parks in this neighborhood, and they wanted more STEM learning surrounding uh, these parks and nature. And so we went out and we provided that for them uh, in, in their own place, in their own setting. Uh, but all of these examples were ways for us to be able to make these community connections and giving them a connection with science in a way that they needed, not in a way that we thought they needed. Another way that we have um, worked with uh, science communication and helping people see science is by reframing the message. And NOKI, the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, does an excellent example of this when it comes to climate change education. Uh, rather than using all of these top-down, heady, catastrophic, crisis, global, refugee discussions that tend to shut people down, um, they reframed the message uh, using values and metaphors to make it more accessible and real and relatable to the public. So we can all, we can all mostly agree that we share the same values. I've got an example here for you of protection. Um, they also have values of uh, preservation and responsibility that tie into our own inherent empathy and our own inherent uh, values to begin the discussion. Uh, this is a way to relate to why it is that we need to do this work and what it is that we're actually protecting and the story that we're telling, why it is that we're doing this. And then they also use metaphors 
Uh, one metaphor would be a heat trapping blanket to explain um, how the atmosphere thickens and changes and traps heat. Uh, the one I have here is discussing the difference between regular CO2 and how that works in the atmosphere and how that's good versus rampant CO2 and that is the anthropogenic human components of how we're adding more CO2 above what is normally a regular system. Um, and reframing these in ways that help people to understand and relate to the message I think is really powerful and is a, one of the techniques that we use in, um, in our programming and exhibit um, design. Now I had the opportunity um, to attend a series of trainings and workshops for the Science Museum of Minnesota called iPage. Um, iPage is really a DEAI initiative that was funded through uh, the National Science Foundation in helping people see themselves in science and also by making science more equitable. And one of the things that I learned in my many trainings over, over many years um, with that fantastic group um, was that the traditional way that I see science, that is the very Eurocentric history of science that I was trained in, you know, pretty much all my scientific career, uh, really um, is only one way to know about the world that you live in. And so the way that we view um, this, the science is sort of the Western Eurocentric view, um, really uh, marginalizes the important contributions that any cultures beyond Europe uh, may have made to the ways that we know about the world that we live in. So there are four general ways that we tend to know. Traditional science tends to live in, in sort of this generalized knowing. Um, that is sort of where academic theories live and logic models. It's really where traditional science lives um, and um, you know, where experimentation lives. Um, and also through practical knowledge, you know, things that we in the world as we go through the world know uh, because we've experienced them, because it's previous actions, because we, we see patterns in the world and we can repeat those patterns. Um, but there are two other areas that I'd like to focus on. Um, that is artistic knowing and foundational knowing. So foundational knowing is really how we make sense of the world. Um, through experience. Um, some of this, of course, is spiritual and natural experience or wisdom and indigenous ancestral wisdom. Um, most, most of this type of wisdom is generally um, disregarded or marginalized, um, but it can be a way to connect with people and see themselves in how we view the world and in science. Artistic knowing is really how we translate our experiences and help other people understand them through visual art, story, narratives, movement, music. Um, of course, art is a fantastic way to create empathy. It's a fantastic way to um, make connections with people. And there's a lot of scientific and knowing and knowledge um, that is uh, represented by both of these two areas that we tend not to really include in uh, our scientific practices. So I'll start with, um, you know, foundational knowledge that is indigenous knowledge. Uh, many of the narratives that we have um, in the Cincinnati area, particularly when it comes to paleontology, talk about the first discovery of fossils by a European group. In the case of Big Bone Lick in the State Historic Site, uh, the narrative that's, that um, is taught is that, you know, French explorers from Canada came down and were the first to discover um, this amazing site that had these huge uh, mammoth and mastodon bones sticking out of the ground. Well, of course, we happen to know that that is not true. Um, I mean, French explorers did come down and discover it, but they were by no means the first and should, and therefore, you know, do not, should not receive sole credit for um, the birthplace of American paleontology. In fact, there are many legends, stories, and narratives associated with indigenous people here who knew of these resources, utilized these resources, and actually taught the Europeans about these resources, uh, particularly the salt springs that attracted all these large animals to the Big Bone Lake area. Um, they, the indigenous people were the people that actually showed, taught, um, 
the Europeans about these salt springs and the benefits of these salt springs, um, both to general use and also to health properties. Uh, so we don't want to marginalize their voices and their stories as being important to the history and the science of Big Bone Lick. Um, and so now when we have exhibits, programming, even festivals, um, Native Americans are a very, very important part. Our regional Shawnee are a very important part of the stories that we tell um, relating to the science and the history of that special place. We are recently creating a new exhibit on the Ordovician fossils in Cincinnati. And sort of the same approach here, uh, the stories of Western scientists coming to Cincinnati, uh, discovering the amazing fossils, being the foundation of the knowledge that uh, we know about um, the fossils in this area, completely marginalizes and disregards the fact that indigenous groups such as the Shawnee and other groups, the Miami, were here long before and knew of these resources and were actually utilizing these resources. Um, so we've included in our exhibit um, foundational knowledge about how uh, the Indigenous people utilize these resources and the significance of them and their discovery um, um, in this region. And so we, we really want to create that narrative where we have uh, that voice, their voice, uh, their part to play uh, recognized and not marginalized. In terms of artistic knowing, um, art is, like I said before, a really fantastic way to connect with people. Um, oftentimes, you know, we are, when it comes to historical events that we know of, we don't have photographs, we weren't there, um, but artists were, and they were recording um, these events through their artwork. And within these pieces of art, we can get a lot of scientific information about them and help to reconstruct alongside with what we know from the geology, um, the events of those days, but also create a sense of empathy and relationship um, with uh, people as they view these things and we talk about them. So art's a really fantastic way to do this. I've shown um, a couple of examples here of a historic volcanic eruptions that really um, had very dramatic consequences and that has been expressed through art. So Tambora in Indonesia erupted in 1815. Um, much of the, what we know about Tambora, of course, comes from the geologic record, but the impacts of Tambora in the years following what's referred to as the year without a summer in 1816 has been depicted in many, many different artworks. Uh, much of the redness that you see here, much of the dim quality of um, the skies is related to the fact that there was a lot of volcanic ash. Um, in the um, in the atmosphere and knowing the date at which these were painted we can understand again how long that volcanic ash had an impact in the character of the uh, atmosphere uh, usually volcanic ash creates brilliant red sunsets and so we can see that um, in the artistry here Krakatoa is another example um, which erupted in 1883 the top right image is a depiction of that um, eruption drawn in 1883, and then some scientists and artists have attributed the scream um, to the uh, effects of Krakatoa a decade later, citing that the very red sky uh, was probably related once again to volcanic ash that still remained in the atmosphere. Art can be a way to make an excellent connection. It also can be a source of scientific information um, and help people to sort of relate through empathy and emotion and feeling to the science of these um, experiences and these events. In our Ordovician exhibit, uh, we are adding a lot of um, art components, everything from drawings to paintings, wood sculpture, uh, bronzes, and also historical um, sketches. Uh, many of these have a ton of scientific research behind ultimately how they end up being depicted. And so it's not mutually exclusive. There is a massive amount of scientific research that goes into making these types of sculptures and drawings, but it is a way for us to be able to translate through art that scientific information. Also, it helps to engage people in their own art 
And uh, we do plan to create an art gallery for people to create their own art um, in the Ordovician exhibit, another way to try to engage with the scientific content. So we've also taken on um, an IMLS grant that um, translates uh, edge principles or edge design attributes um, into our exhibit development for our Ordovician gallery. Um, edge stands for Exhibit Designs for Girls Engagement. And um, there are sort of nine, what we call the noble nine attributes that have been researched heavily that help make girls um, engage more with STEM content in an exhibit setting. And the important thing to note about this is that all of these design attributes don't exclude boys or other groups. In fact, they help to enhance the experience of everybody by really thinking about these noble nine attributes that focus um, on engaging girls in STEM. There's a lot here, and I only want to actually really talk about one of them, which is people imagery, um, right here for the moment. Um, many of these are drawings. We use familiar objects. Uh, we create whimsical humor experiences. There's a lot of engagement. Um, but specifically for our Ordovician gallery, we've been focusing on all of these, but I want to highlight showing people. And when we think about science and talking about the history of science and the people that have laid the path for science in exhibits, we tend to get um, something that looks a little bit like this. Um, I just pulled this off an online exhibit at the History of Science. Um, a lot of uh, white males that have contributed greatly to our science. This is not to say certainly that this is not incredibly valuable. We have our, our female here, Marie Curie. Um, for the most part, this is not something that really helps people see themselves in science or create a STEM identity. Uh, it's important to talk about the history of science, um, but it's important to be inclusionary in that history of science and help people see themselves by providing them images and experiences that allow them to create that STEM identity. And so for our Ordovician Gallery, what we've done is we have included alongside the historical images of people who have contributed greatly to our understanding of our local geology and paleontology is more modern inclusionary images of amateurs and families um, in paleontology and also give them a little bit of a voice in the gallery. So it's not so much that we are translating their experiences for them, but they are doing it for themselves. And so every one of these have a quote or a story behind um, why they are in that gallery next to the specimen that they actually collected. Uh, in this way, we hope that we can make a rel uh, relatable connection to people and allow themselves to see that science is accessible and um, relatable um, by talking to the actual people or seeing the actual people that do that science in the exhibit. This is a very quick overview of some of the ways that we have tried to uh, get people to see themselves more in science by making connections, uh, by making relationships, and by giving them voice and imagery that allows them to cultivate um, a STEM identity. I have worked, like I said, for 17 years at the Museum Center. Um, I have wonderful, amazing colleagues, both in the sciences and in the museum itself, in the museum world. And so I want to thank all of them for uh, getting me to where I am today in this very exciting venture, being able to speak to you. And I'd like to thank you for your attention.